Thank you all for coming. It's great to see y'all. Um, and for those of us who are meeting for the first time, um, it's also nice to meet you. Um, quick intro for myself. I'm Keith Branham. I'm the Secretary General for Sermon Charlotte 2021. Um, and welcome to the first uh, International Relations Career Panel being hosted by Sermon Charlotte. Um, we have three wonderful guests here who I will let them uh, introduce themselves and their story um, and their resume. They are... Um, you know, they have graciously decided to take some time out of their day. Some um, as close as um, as close as here in the United States, all the way around the world in a whole nother time zone altogether. Um, so, yep. Yeah, um, but we will be joined here by Dr. Gary Nordlinger uh, from George Washington University. Um, Mr. Matt Smither, uh, who also hails as a former Sermon uh, SG, um, hailing from Afghanistan. And Yanel Cruz, um, and remind me, Yanel, I know last we talked, you were in Spain, but you are now where? Well, I am now in the UK, although currently physically in DC, but I live in the oh, UK. Never mind, then we have people yeah. who are a lot closer than we thought. So, yeah. all righty. Well, I'm going to just, I'm going to pass the baton. There'll be a few questions that, you know, I will ask as the moderator, but then depending on time, um, for those who might have questions, um, or who submitted questions early, I will look at those. If, um, you know, otherwise, as we have time, if you have other questions, feel free to put them into the chat and I will uh, take them as to the best as I can. Um, but other than that, why don't we start with Dr. Nordlinger and we will move to Mr. Smithers and then to Ms. Cruz and we'll just do the same thing again uh, with each question. So, uh, Dr. Nordlinger. Well, thank you so much. Uh, my name is Gary Nordlinger. And I teach in the Graduate School of Political Management of George Washington University. Uh, we are the world's oldest and largest school of applied politics. We have three wonderful master's degrees that are available both in the classroom and online and a number of graduate certificates that go along with it. I teach in our global politics program. Uh, that is a program that's set up for people who want to learn how to go into different cultures and different political systems and make an impact on public policy, public opinion, political behavior. Uh, my career before I quote unquote retired into academia was that of a political and public affairs consultant, not only in the United States, but 40 countries, including the United States. And I appreciate the opportunity to be here with you today. Matt. Uh, thanks, Keith. Uh, thanks, everybody who's joining in. I know how these conferences can be. I'm not that far removed. As Keith mentioned, I was the Secretary General of Sermon Atlanta in 2013, I believe. Um, but Great to be here. Thank you, Keith, and thank you, everyone. My name is Matt Smither. I'm an international development uh, practitioner. Uh, I'm currently based in Kabul, Afghanistan. I've been working here on various projects for a little over five years. Uh, my main focus in my work, both here in Afghanistan and prior, has been on post-conflict stabilization, um, natural resources, and agriculture. Um, so looking forward to the discussion today. Thank you very much. Great. Hi, everyone. Um, thank you so much, first of all, to have me. It's great to be back at Sermon, though in a different capacity. Um, I've been involved as a delegate, as an AD, as a director, and I, I did spend like a few years working in Sermon, so it's nice to be back. Um, so my name is Yanel I'm currently a graduate student at the University of Oxford, where I study evidence-based social intervention and policy evaluation. I have an undergraduate degree in sociology, but I concentrated in political sociology. And my career kind of has gone down a lot of different paths, to be quite honest with you. I've kind of tiptoed between domestic policy, international policy, a combination of both. Um, so I've really done quite a lot. Um, currently, on top of being a full-time grad student. I'm involved in a lot of different research projects at Oxford. So I'm involved with the School of Government over there where we have this massive database um, called the COVID-19 Government Tracker. So we're tracking government responses to COVID-19 from every country in the world, which is um, quite a feat. And if you are interested in my comparative analysis, I do recommend that you access that. All of our data is open access. So you can always 
look into it and sort of compare how countries are reacting to the pandemic. I also work with the Sustainable Urban Development um, Department at Oxford doing some research over there. And then also with a new group that came up at Oxford called Green Recovery Now, where basically we're, we are working with governments to try to incentivize them to add green policies to their COVID-19 recovery plans, especially right now as countries are starting to sort of figure out how they're gonna come back from this pandemic. We want climate change to be a part of those policies as well. So, um, so, so yeah, I do quite a lot, but really I would say um, in a nutshell, I am a social and urban policy researcher um, and I've worked a lot in policy fields and research fields. So I'm happy to talk about that further. Excellent, excellent. Well, thank you all for the uh, for the wonderful introductions, and we're going to dive right into our first question, which is, um, and again, for some of you, this you know you'll answer this question maybe a little differently, so we'll just see. Um, you know, I think for a lot of our folks, we'd love to know how you began your career. Did you always know what that you wanted to play a role in the political and international arena? Um, you know, uh, why don't you tell us a little bit about that? We'll start with Dr. Nordlinger. Yeah, thanks, Keith. Um, you know, my career has been evolving, really, literally, since the day I first entered college. I entered college as an undeclared major. The registrar randomly assigned me two courses, including, you know, in essence, Introduction to International Relations. I think it was called World Politics and, quote unquote, Modern Government, their intro to political science. And I fell in love with them both. Um, I started, I started as a political campaign consultant because it was relatively early in the profession and it combined my interest in statistics and the Congress and politics. And, you know, I ended up having an interesting career doing it. The thing with campaign consulting is living on that sense of, living on that sense of self-importance and adrenaline is addictive when you're in your 20s and 30s. At some point in your 40s, you know, you just get tired of being in a constant barroom brawl for six months and not eating off plates, et cetera, et cetera. So fortunately, um, I had built up a public affairs aspect to my business. So when I got sick of campaigning in the United States, I had the public affairs, which was frankly far more profitable. Uh, to fall back on. And then, you know, that's when I started working internationally, both in politics and public affairs. Now we'll go to Matt. Yeah, thank you, Keith. Um, you know, I, I, I like what my previous panel member said, you know, and, and I think I would maybe say, um, professionally, if you're talking about when do you begin your career, I would say it's long before college as well. You know, I, I think back and I like everything I've done has led me to this point. Um, you know, even the things that I didn't expect would be part of the path that led me to international affairs and international development, working abroad as an expat. Um, you know, and, and I know that we've got a lot of folks who are in college now. You guys are juggling a number of things. You've got this whole pandemic thing, right? But you're also thinking, okay, well, what comes next? How do I pay my rent? How do I do all of these things? And, and you know, as I was thinking about this question that you sent earlier, Keith, I, I thought back to some of the work that I did in college. Um, I didn't come from a whole lot. Uh, my parents did what they could, but I worked my entire undergraduate career. And I would say the experiences that I picked up there are just as important as any academic classroom, as any internship, as any fellowship, any place that you can get experience, that you can learn something new about yourself or how to work with others well, that's when you start your career. Um, so I guess that that's my little mini soapbox. Um, whatever you do can be part of your professional development as long as you understand what it is you're learning and you learn how to, to take that forward with you. Yeah, and I think I'll, I'll definitely have to agree with what Matt said because my answer was gonna be very similar to that. I think sometimes you fall in the trap of believing that your career will begin the first time you have your full-time job post-college when in reality, that's not the start of your career. It's really whatever job experience. And, and I even say like 
on paid internships, even though you're not getting paid for it, that is still extremely valuable experience. So for me, I started, you know, tutoring Spanish at my undergrad. And that was sort of like the one job that I had that I had throughout my entire four years of my undergrad. And then I had a bunch of internships here and there. But that job tutoring Spanish taught me so much about just cross-cultural communication and like how to sort of learn how to navigate, you know, people who were coming from all kinds of different cultures, because the people that I was tutoring weren't just American students, they were also students from really all over the world that wanted to learn Spanish. And so I think like, you know, now you would look at the jobs that I've had in the past couple of years, and you would think, oh, like tutoring Spanish has nothing to do with that. But in reality, there's so much that you can learn from every kind of job. Um, and so I think, you know, counting, I think just sort of every experience that you've had is really important and definitely don't feel like your career is going to start until you got that first full-time job. And I also will say like, it's okay to pivot to, I've definitely changed um, the path that I've sort of tried to follow throughout, you know, trying different things. I think it's really important to not fall in the trap of having to follow a, a very like linear path. And certainly if you look at my background, it hasn't been linear at all. But like Matt was saying, every experience does sort of lead you to where you are in the present moment. And for me currently, I love where I'm at. I love the work that I get to do. And without every single thing that I have done in the past, I probably wouldn't have gotten to this specific point. So I would say in terms of careers, like you know, try everything and don't be discouraged to try everything. And also don't feel that just because you're not getting, you know, the fanciest internships or you're not doing like these like opportunities that other people are doing that you're going to fall behind because that's definitely not true. I always fall into the trap about the mute. Um, that being said, you know, I would, I do want to just echo like one thing that I think is just a universal value across all. And that's, you know, just being open to risk taking and being open to just trying new things. Um, you know, I think every one of you, including myself would say like, we may not have started out thinking we were going to be where and doing what we're doing, but you know, here we are. And, you know, it was because we were active and thinking about, you know, how can we, you know, what are we doing and what, what else is, what else is out there? So, uh, but I'll get off my soapbox. Oh, Dr. Nordlinger. Yeah. Just to follow up and please call me Gary, pick up on what both Yanel and Matt were saying. Um, as I've gotten older in life, I've realized that learning what I do not want to do is even more valuable than learning what I do want to do. And the advantage of, you know, having a part-time job or an internship is, you can start crossing things off your list. It's why I encourage students to go to law school at night, for example, and work full time uh, in a law firm during the day. I think they want to work in a law firm, let me preface that, because it gives you time to test drive different uh, organizational paths to go when, it, when you're still in school and you're not, you know, for lack of better words, playing for keeps on your career path. This is actually a really great segue to the second question, which, you know, what is the most unexpected and enjoyable part of your career? Or, you know, in Gary's case, um, you know, talk, even talking to students about, you know, how to think about this stuff. Um, you know, there's a lot of skills that are needed for a lot of these jobs um, and a lot of different levels to it. But, you know, and as part of that, you know, what do you wish you knew from the start? It's a two-part question. Um, we'll start with Gary. Oh, brother, that is a tough question, Keith. Um, <laughs> Sorry. Th there is very little I would redo if I had it to do all over again. In all honesty, there, you know, there's some phone calls I probably would not return, and there's some phone calls I regret not having returned. But if I had to do it all over again, I'd do it all over again. And let me add, um, I, I, I had gotten a master's degree in political science and international relations. So I was actually you know, planning on working toward a PhD. But ironically, I realized, hey, I really don't want a career in academia. I want a career in politics. So I started Nordlinger Associates at the same time as I started Knight Law School on the theory, okay, this way I have four years to fail as a political consultant before it hurts me professionally. And, you know, lucky for me, I actually ended up making it as a political consultant and 
often need to practice law. I'll jump in, I think. Yeah, okay. Um, yeah, Matt. <laughs> I'll, I'll, take, uh, I'll take the first part of your question, Keith, because I really don't know how to answer uh, something I wish I had known from the start. Uh, yeah, but, but I would say, you know, if we think about what are some of the most enjoyable and unexpected um, parts of my career, I would say it was those things that I wasn't expecting and those things that I had to work especially hard for. Um, you know, for me, my biggest professional achievements have also been the moments when I put a lot of work in. And so, you know, as it relates to the conversation today, I would say, you know, delegates don't think that your creative mind needs to be done when you when you leave, you know, events and conferences and things like this, you can carry that forward professionally. And as an example, you know, one of the, the big projects that I've been working on is a is a national survey. So we're doing a survey of 16 provinces out of 34 provinces in Afghanistan, interviewing thousands of farmers, setting up focus groups, right? And the methodology behind the survey is using satellite imagery to target specific farmer groups and populations within a one square kilometer area. And, and that way you have a targeted sampling. And, and I guess my whole point is just to say, work hard and be creative and don't be constrained by what's done before. Use moments like sermon to really expand the way that you think about the world, think about different topics. And you know, I, I think our world is so interconnected, you have to start pulling on these different threads. So public health isn't just about getting vaccines in arms, it's about supply trucks, it's about fuel, right? So I guess what I'm saying is think broadly and be willing to put the work in. And if you put the work in, it'll be rewarded. Yeah, and I'll just have to say, um, it's, it's actually Matt's answer is a perfect leeway into what I was going to say, because for me, something that I think was unexpected, but that I've also found incredibly enjoyable is how interdisciplinary working in like public policy can be. Um, you know, I used to think, oh, I have to do political science or IR and I have to like stick down this path. But really, um, you, you, you know, policy requires so much from so many different things. There's, you know, econ to consider, there's like public health, there's like all these different aspects that go into it. I mean, one of my colleagues came from a computer science background and now he's like doing the same research projects that we're doing. And he's like using his computer science background to inform technology policy and like privacy and all these different things. So there really is like a lot of room for creativity. And I think that's one of the things also that if I have to answer like what I wish I knew is that, you know, don't be afraid to sort of, I know it sounds cliche to say think outside the box and people often will tell you, oh, think outside the box, but truly like, you know, don't be afraid even if you're sitting in a meeting and you think, oh, this idea sounds so far-fetched, ju just say it because you'll be surprised. I think people sometimes um, like kind of think that like, you know, I, we can't be too, you, we can't take too many risks or, you know, but I think especially working in fields of, you know, public policy, international affairs, sometimes it requires that creativity and sort of that risk taking because the truth of the matter is that for many years, things have been done a certain way. And I think we've now come to learn maybe those aren't the best solutions to many of the problems that we're facing. So it requires really sort of, you know, again, not to use a cliche, but really stepping outside of that comfort zone and, and not being afraid to sort of speak out, even if your idea might seem crazy, um, you know, just, just sort of be creative and get out there. And I think also something that I would add is that I also used to be very uncomfortable with admitting that I didn't know something or that I was confused by things and something that I think has helped me immensely in my career is to get comfortable with being the person in the room that says, you know what, I don't know what that means. Can you clarify? Or can we like go over this again? Because I think that also shows that you're like very actively engaged with the work that you do. And it's okay to be the one person in the room who might not know something. In fact, that's a positive thing because it means you're going to leave that room having learned something new. And I think that's, you know, learning doesn't stop after college. It certainly doesn't stop after, you know, experiences like Sermon. You can always sort of keep learning, keep growing, keep evolving. And I think that's an important thing that I wasn't so aware of, but now I'm really glad that, 
that's something that I try to put into practice every day. And I, oh, I lost my question sheet for the hottest second. <laughs> Too many windows. Um, yeah. <laughs> so and this actually brings us to the last of my, of my moderator questions, which is like, what do you think are the, and we've actually kind of touched on this a little bit too, but what do you think are the most important qualities and skills that are maintained by people, you know, within this career path, within your career field? And, you know, um, as an extension to that, you know, our delegates are going to be here for three days with us. Um, you know, hopefully it'll be a great one. I believe it'll be a great experience, but what could you encourage them to keep in mind as they go through this process um, and apply to this conversation about future careers and pursuing this field? And again, we'll start with Dr. with Gary. You know, just number one, straight off the top of my head without even needing to think about it is a sense of personal ethics. Um, mm. Mm. Everyone you deal with needs to know that you're a person of your word, that you have integrity, uh, that you're trustworthy, that you will do what you say you're going to do. You know, just that whole broad sense of integrity. I I've sat through a million commencements, and the only speaker I ever remembered was when my cousin got his Master's of Business Administration. And the speaker said, look, you're all smart people or you wouldn't have gotten into this program much less graduated, but I'll tell you this, if you do not have a sense of ethics, you will destroy yourself. And yeah, there, there are billions of people in this world, but you know what, in your professional communities, these are small towns globally you're gonna be dealing with and your reputation is going to be everything. So that's number one for me. Pass it on down. <laughs> oh man, this is like when you're a delegate and you follow up that person who just gave a great speech and you're like, oh, I don't know what to say now. <laughs> <laughs> no, uh, I think that that's a that's a great point. Um, I had written down a couple of things, but I'll just highlight two things that I think are really critical and and really kind of undervalued. Uh, the first is having the ability to write professionally. Um, taking complex, difficult subjects and being able to, to take all of that information and distill it into a few paragraphs, one page maximum. Um, this is a huge portion of my job here. Uh, we have to take in large amounts of data, synthesize it, and deliver it to our client. Uh, and that's my role. Um, and I think that, that that sense of professional writing is really undervalued. And I think tied to that, the other thing that I thought of were hard skills. Um, you know, it, it may sound a little bit ridiculous, but take an Excel class, right? Know how to work a budget. Um, know how to use all different types of IT systems, project management systems, um, be up to date on ICT and what's happening in the information and communication technology sector. Uh, that will lead to professional success, in my opinion. Yeah, I think something that I wanted to highlight was like a soft skill and a hard skill. So my soft skill is actually quite similar to what Gary was saying. I think just the art of relationship building and the art of sort of working with other people is something that I think you get a lot of opportunity to do at Sermon. Um, but I think more importantly, it's, you know, learning how to like compromise, learning how to work with a team. And I think sometimes I remember being a delegate and I know things can get heated and sometimes you just do not want to listen to that person that, you know, does not have the idea that you want and you just want to get yours through. And I think it's really important to sort of learn the art of, of dialogue and the, or the art of compromise. And I think like that is key no matter what kind of job you're going to have because you are going to have to work with teams you're going to have to work with people from all kinds of fields all kinds of organizations and so learning how to be an active listener so listen not just to respond to what people are saying but actually listen to what they're saying don't be you know formulating your answer as soon as they start speaking um because that's just not a product that's not going to be a productive conversation. So I think just in general, Sermon gives you so many different um, scenarios to be able to learn how to work with, across, you know, with people from like all kinds of like political backgrounds, people from, you know, all kinds of regions in the country. So I think just really take this opportunity to practice that skill 
And I think I also will echo writing was one of the skills that I wrote down. I think learning how to write for all kinds of different audiences. I think sermon for me, the technical writing aspect of it made it really easy for me to then learn how to write policy briefs, learn how to, you know, like just to really like practice that. It can seem tedious sometimes. I, I remember those days as a delegate where I was like, I don't know why we have to follow this format. Why do we have to use this specific language? But at the end of the day, trust me, you'll be thankful that you learned how to do that. And I, I think also public speaking, it goes sort of like hand in hand. So learning how to be a speaker that can be persuasive a speaker that knows how to be concise, you know, learning how to say what you need to say within a specific time frame and learning how to like really, it's not just sort of get gathering the courage to get up and speak, which is extremely important, but I think also just learning how to be an effective speaker. And I think Sermon gives you a lot of opportunities to do that. I know virtually that might look a little different, but, but I truly do hope that you all get a chance to sort of practice those skills and, and you'll be thankful a few years down the line that you actually were able to do this. Because for me, in work interviews, my experience doing Model UN constantly comes up because I just learned so much um, through the many years that I did this. So really just take advantage of that. Hi, Gary, you have something to add? Yeah, if you don't mind. Um, one of my favorite cliches is the people you snub on your way up or the ones you meet on your way down. I mean, frankly, Andrew Cuomo in New York is a perfect example, you know, I mean, as somebody puts it, Andrew's big problem is everyone hates him. But <laughs> don't burn bridges, don't make enemies unnecessarily. Uh, Biden had to withdraw his nominee for OMB director, and then yesterday I saw where one of his assistant secretary nominees is in trouble because of tweets they made attacking U.S. senators. So, you know, if you're a relatively obscure person, why are you even making highly partisan tweets attacking U.S. senators? I mean, forgive me, who cares about your opinion? But you can't go before the United States Senate and ask to be confirmed when you've insulted most of them. So again, you know, try not to make enemies unnecessarily. Can I add something? Sorry, I'll just, I'll be super quick before we open it up. Go ahead. Because uh, I think that that was really great. And, and I do want to highlight something that I think may be difficult to hear. And, and that's exactly what you said, Gary, is like, nobody cares about your opinion. Um, and, I, and I hate to say it bluntly like that, but I would say that as a call to action, right? Like, you have to demand a place at the table for yourself. Um, you have to make sure that your voice is heard. No one can do that for you and you shouldn't expect anyone to do that for you. So if you feel that you are in the know, that you need to make a statement about what's going on, make it. Uh, don't wait for someone else to open the door for you. Because uh, at the end of the day, you have to be the person that, that you advocate for. You know, I, I actually, I've got to just throw in quick two cents because we have a few audience questions, but like if there's one thing that Sermon did teach me and something that I really learned in my career, which was taking everything that was just said by these panelists, but also like learning when and how to seize an opportunity and how to do it really, really well. And just make sure that you, when you see the opportunity to get something done and to push a conversation, like, it, you know, whether it's your job, whether it's a policy, whether it's an issue you care about, like go do it. And do it again, like Gary said, with integrity, because um, your reputation really will carry you sometimes much farther than the project that you did and the results you got. So anyway, so that was my soapbox, but we're gonna, I'm gonna pass it along to the audience, um, which we have several questions. And you know, there was one question that stuck out to me, which is, um, ah, well, uh, actually, hold on, sorry. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So. And since we're on this conversation of personal relationships, um, this question uh, came up. Before pursuing a career in international relations, cool. oh, who is, can we mute? Matt. <laughs> it's okay. It's okay. Um, before pursuing a career in international relations, what fears, if any, did you have? For example, you know, there's, Frequent international travel, negative impacts on personal relationships, friends and colleagues, something we were just talking about a moment. Um, obviously, sometimes and in, in many ways, the world has maybe become a more dangerous place. Like what, 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 what fears did you have? 
And since he's actually in Kabul, why don't we start with Matt and we'll just move to Yanel and then to Gary. Oh boy, that is a loaded question. Um, look, I, I, I maybe have a, a little bit of a unique experience as an expatriate. Um, as I mentioned in the beginning, I currently work in Kabul. I've been here for a number of years. Um, I live in a highly securitized environment um, and there's a certain level of risk that you have to accept to work in an environment like this. Um, it takes a particular kind of person to be able to work in an environment like this. And that's, that's not to disparage anybody who, who doesn't wanna do it, but you have to be willing to miss things like birthdays and anniversaries and holidays. And that can, that can be very difficult. Um, you know, one of the advantages I think that we have now is that we're so connected, right? Like the world is, is at once both smaller and larger. Um, the fact that I'm able to call in while eight and a half hour Asian step, you know, is, it's, it's truly remarkable, right? But um, I think if you want to go into international affairs, then you need to be comfortable with living outside of your native country. Uh, and you need to be able to immerse yourself in the environment to the extent that you're able. Um, and I think that that has to be able to replace some things that, that, you wouldn't, that you would normally partake in if you were living in your native country. So I'm not sure if that's a great answer or not, but um, I'm willing to talk more if there are follow-up questions there. Yeah, I mean, I'm happy to also, um, I think I was gonna say something along similar lines too. So I've, you know, had a lot of different experiences moving. I've moved, I don't even know how many times in the past couple of years, I've been in the US, I've been in Spain, I've been in the UK, I've worked in Chile, like I've sort of hopped from one place to another and not quite extremely unsafe places, but I think just the comfort of being able to, to step outside of whatever your comfort zone is, whether that's your country, your local city, whatever it is. Um, I know that I will always, now I'm really comfortable with sort of, if an opportunity pops up and I have to pack my bags, I kind of just do it. But in the beginning of it, there definitely was that fear of the unknown, the fear of, you know, I would even get bogged down by the logistical details of things like, oh, how am I gonna find a place to live? Like all these things would really stress me out. And I think at the end of the day, when I actually got to the places, everything was fine, you know? Um, and I think also, I think just, just being able to, you know, not be afraid to take that risk and, and just, it's okay that you're going to experience discomfort, especially if you do want to have a career that allows you to be in different places of the world, you will experience discomfort. You will have moments where like, you might not speak the language and you're confused and you're like, what is going on? That's okay. Embrace that. And, and, you know, that and talking about personal relationships, embrace that because that also helps you then reach out to other people. I know for me, local relationships that I've made in every place that I've been in were key in sort of helping me through the, the projects or the things that I was working on. So I think just sort of being comfortable with that. And, and, and also I think like Matt was saying, being comfortable with the fact that you will miss things out at home. I know for me, for the longest time, I was like, my career is going to be in DC. I'm going to be in DC forever. And I was really afraid of leaving the DC environments. But the truth of the matter is that it's really easy to always come back. And so, you know, if you have an opportunity somewhere else and you might feel like, oh, I don't know if I should do it, just do it. I, don't, I would also add when you're young, it's so much easier to take these opportunities than when you get older. That's advice that I keep getting over and over and over. People just tell me, you're young, go across the world, pack your bags, do whatever, because then life sort of starts giving you more responsibilities that makes it harder to then step back from. So I think right now is key if you want to sort of take that crazy job, I don't know, across the world and everybody's telling you no, if you want it, just do it. And, and trust me, things will work out. Gary, you're muted. Yeah, thanks. Can you hear me now? Yes. Yeah. Totally agree. Number one, when I started Nordlinger Associates, I was 25 years old. I had no clients and no investors, but I also didn't have a family to support. So it's far easier to take your risks when you are young, number one. Number two, for those of you that actually want to have families, do think about the toll this can take. 
Uh, when I was growing up, I went to eight different schools, K through 12, eight different schools. And that is not a good recipe, in my opinion, for raising a child. So my kids are now in 10th and 12th grades, but I have made an absolute point of providing them stability. I mean, they're still hanging out now with people they knew, you know, since they were age three. So, you know, you do, if you're planning on having a family, you need to figure out how to balance this. Great, that was awesome. Um, we're actually gonna go to a very specific question, which I know is on the minds of many. In fact, it was on my mind as a delegate, which is um, how does Model UN contribute to a future professional profession in national security uh, studies and careers? Um, why don't, actually, we're gonna continue the trend. Why don't we start with Yanel and we'll work our way to Gary and Matt. Yeah, sure. So I have never worked in national security, so I won't be able to give a very specific answer. But I think something that I will say is um, take all of the skills that you learn. So, you know, like just like we were saying, the, you know, the writing skills, the public speaking skills, the skills of building relationships and sort of use that to leverage when you're applying to a lot of different opportunities. I think something that's very unique about doing Model UN is that you dive really deep into whatever topics it is that your committee is going to discuss. And I think you almost become sort of like a mini expert on a very specific topic. And I, I sort of found that even when I'm applying to opportunities that might not have been related to that, I can still find ways to talk about those things. I remember specifically once there was something we discussed when I, when I served as a delegate in the Security Council, and then I was applying to an internship in the summer that was not related at all, but the process of sort of preparing for, for that particular conference and everything that I had to read and everything that I had to do was a similar process as to the internship that I was going to take, even though it was in a completely different field. And I sort of leveraged that and used that to my advantage. So I think learning how to speak about your model UN experience, I think something that's really important is like, be able to like quantify it and say, you know, I was in a conference with X number of people in a committee with X number of people. I think those things, when you quantify things in your resume, particularly, it makes it stand out. So I think definitely, I can't get into specifics of national security, but definitely like take the entire holistic experience and learn how to basically like use it as a way to market yourself. And I think that's really going to be key. I think also building relationships is key as we've been saying. So so network with your fellow delegates who might also be interested in a national security career, because even though you're not currently all in the field, in a few years from now, you will all be. And so it's really helpful to sort of know, hey, I can call that person from, from Sermon that year who's working in this job and I'm interested in it. So let me go ahead and like call them and have like an informational coffee with them. So, so really try to like find out who else has your interests and try to keep in touch with them because a few years from now, it's very likely that you're going to be navigating the same field together. And so it's really helpful to sort of have someone that you can, you know, that you can always call and, and get more information from. Now we'll move to Gary. Yeah, thanks. Um, I, I, I'm going to have to echo what Yanel was saying. I think that any opportunity that you have to meet people uh, develop friendships and relationships and to advocate a position is just, you know, time very, very well spent. Um, I can literally trace every dollar I've ever made directly or indirectly to someone I had lunch with, had a drink with, took to a baseball game. And the more experience and practice you can get at these things. I mean, I often, you know, will sit down with my students and just talk about you're at a reception and you don't know anybody. How do you strike up conversations, for example? So I, I think the Model UN provides many, many wonderful opportunities for you. But I think among them are exactly what Yanel was saying. Thanks. Yeah, I, I mean, I don't think I have much else to add here. Um, perhaps I'll just touch on the national security component a little bit, because I think that that my previous panelists have really rounded out the, the question. I just say, look, if you're seriously interested in national security, getting involved in national security on a governmental level, remember what Gary said earlier, um, your digital paper trail will follow you. 
Um, so if this is an area that you're truly interested in, be careful what you say on Twitter, be careful what you post on social media, um, you know, understand that these things can and will be found. Um, so if, if you're serious about uh, any type of career where you're going to have to have a certain level of clearance, um, make sure you're, you're taking the right choices at this point. Oh, there we go. Okay. And this actually is a question. This next question was actually directed at Dr. Nordlinger. Sorry, Gary. Um, but there was, but, you know, I also think it may be applicable to other things as well, to everyone else. Um, what recommendations, since you talked about law school at what point, what recommendations do you have for someone who is thinking about going to law school? Um, you know, what, you know, you mentioned law school at night. Most schools will not let you work during the first year. What recommendations, I'll add to this, what recommendations do you think for folks who are thinking about becoming lawyers um, or not becoming lawyers? Um, what would you say? Listen, law school is a wonderful form of education for even if you don't want to practice law. That said, is it worth spending $150,000 in three or four years of your life if you're not planning on practicing law? That I don't know. I knew I wanted a Washington, D.C. career. So I thought a combination of a law degree and a political science degree was a good combination. And I, you know, I stand by that. But a lot of it, to answer your question specifically, it's is there a certain place you want to live and practice law? If so, go to law school in that city, for example. Uh, are you interested in a political career? Then often, you know, going to the most prominent state law school in that state is a good way to enter a political career because you're going to be meeting other would-be politicians in that law program. Uh, go to, you know, yeah, it, not all law schools let you go have a night program. So if you want to go at night, choose one that does have a night program. I mean, Georgetown's a highly regarded law school with a night program. George Washington's a very respected program with a night program. George Mason University, a wonderful law school that is not expensive that has a night program. I mean, it's like I tell potential students at GSPM, work during the day, do this program at night, don't put your career on hold, have an income, but more importantly, find out what it is you wanna do. You know, with my students, maybe you think you wanna work for that international public affairs firm, go work there now and find out. At law school, uh, maybe you think you want a big firm, you know, go check it out. And uh, by the way, just to stay current, I've do run this past my friends who are now literally senior or managing partners of prominent law firms. They like the night school approach. I can tell you this, every single one of my classmates that were in night school working in big firms got job offers from those firms. And at least one case, she is running this huge firm now. So, you know, I think night law school is a very attractive path and, you know, Find a program at a night law school if the one you have in mind doesn't offer one. That said, I mean, you know, if you can go to Harvard Law School, do it. Back to you, Keith. <laughs> oh my gosh, I'll never get used to this. Um, Matt, you know, would you add anything about advice about law school? Didn't go to law school. <laughs> um, <laughs> yes. Yeah. Uh, I, I got a master's degree um, a few years after I graduated undergrad. The only thing that I would say is if you're looking at continuing education, um, again, I don't have the law school background, so I can't speak to that. But if you're looking at getting a master's, uh, any type of grad school, get some experience. Uh, don't go straight into grad school from undergrad. Um, you know, it, it, it probably won't end well. <laughs> Um, if at very least you'll end up with a whole lot of debt. Um, so take some time, go to the Peace Corps, find ways to get scholarships, find ways to get support to help you go to grad school uh, if that's your ultimate goal. That's what I'd add. Yeah, I, I don't have much else to add beyond just, you know, really give 
you know, try out different things. And I think similar to the point that Gary was saying, if you really think that you want to, you know, be a lawyer, try to find opportunities now that allow you to experience law. For me, I was convinced for the longest time I wanted to go to law school. And then I worked for the Spanish Commission for Refugee Assistance in Spain, doing a lot of legal work. I worked alongside lawyers and found that while I there were aspects of the job that I liked, the actual, you know, legal aspect of it, sort of being an attorney, like a practicing attorney was not quite for me. I found that I enjoyed more like engaging with the legal scholarship and the legal philosophy rather than actually being in a courthouse, you know, doing the actual practice of law. So had I not done that, I probably would have been, you know, preparing for law school now and, and going down a path that probably wouldn't have been the path for me. So if you can find any kind of opportunity, I know there's usually a lot of um, volunteer services too, where like law firms look for volunteers to even help sort of like database management, whatever it is, try to sort of find some opportunity now that exposes you a little bit to law so that then you can decide you know, is it really for me? Because I think, I think like Gary said, it is a big commitment, not just financially, but time-wise. And so you really want to make sure that you think about that. Can I, so Keith, do you mind if I jump in just really quickly? Sure. Um, and, and I don't know, perhaps my fellow panelists won't agree with me as well as some of the people in the audience, but there's a big push to take an internship, to get some experience. And I think that that's perfectly fine. But I, I just want to note too, that not everybody has the ability to take an unpaid internship. That's for a very particular type of student. And if you don't have the ability to take an unpaid internship, don't ever doubt yourself, right? Like find something that will get you the income that you need to survive without making yourself beholden to a massive debt that you'll never be able to get out of. Um, yeah, that, that's what I got to say about internships. Mm -hmm. And I'll also say I never took an unpaid internship because, and, and there, again, can be plenty of disagreements, but I felt that my time should always be compensated. Um, and so whatever that compensation may be, you know, I worked that out between the person who was giving it and not, but yeah. That, that's just one thing that I wanted to insert. And I actually, you know, again, I think Matt does make a really, really great point. And I'll actually just add one thing as some, um, having gone to a master's program myself and considered law school, um, I decided that I did not want that level of debt. And I decided to instead go get an MPA right out of undergrad, um, thinking to myself, you know what, I should get a practical skills degree. Um, and in many ways, while I didn't think at the time, uh, some of the, the skills became relevant when I ended up becoming into management positions and learn, needed to manage a budget, when in fact I needed to start learning how to fundraise, that, that background was really, really, really important, and became much more valuable than I ever expected. So um, there, are, there are people who will press you for law, but there are also great programs in the public policy world. Um, and in many other professions that you never know whether or not they're gonna bring you in the direction you want. But again, the joy of the career is learning on the time, like what you're really, really good at. So, um, and we've actually exhausted, believe it or not, our audience questions. Oh, sorry. I actually did have one other question, uh, which is um, asking about the average day on the job and I think, you know, this is more relevant to some than others, but um, why don't, you know, why don't we start with Matt and we'll work our way around and this will probably be the last question. So Matt, like, can you describe the average day on your job? <laughs> uh, yeah. Oh boy. Um, okay. So look, my, my role right now is the acting chief of party for a 55 million USAID funded program. Um, I'm responsible for six offices throughout the country. I've got a total of 170 staff that I supervise at any one time. Um, my day varies dramatically. Um, I, I guess, uh, yeah, wow. So um, I put out fires. That's my job. 
uh, and I strategically focus our team on what are our objectives. So that is what takes up the majority of my day. Now that can be anything from, we didn't get the right fuel in a generator, so now our office doesn't have power in the eastern part of the country, to USAID has just rolled out their new plans for development objectives, and we need to reorganize our work plan and budget around those. Um, so I think, you know, if, if I can tie this back to Model UN, you know, when we would do training, uh, I would lead our team for, for different kind of training for Model UN, right? And we would have a, a quick fire speaker series. So we would have a bowl with topics on a piece of paper. You would walk up and you would have to immediately give a 30 second speech on whatever was that piece of paper. Um, that same skill can be used in your job. And it's certainly one that I use in mine. Uh, you don't know what's coming around the turn, but you've got to be able to rely on your experience, your knowledge, and you've got to be self-conscious to know that you actually do have value and you have experience that you can bring to the table and bring it. And you know? Yeah, um, so my days look very chaotic currently, especially because I'm not working full-time in one specific position. I'm sort of juggling my master's degree, and then also three different research um, jobs that I hold. Uh, but I guess like if we're talking about what does it look like to be a social policy researcher, um, it can look very different from day to day. I sometimes spend time sort of having to sit down at a desk and just do you know data analysis and sort of input data. Sometimes it requires having a lot of meetings, a lot of um, working with like a lot of different um, people from across the world makes it so that you con kind of constantly have to be in meetings throughout the day, meeting time zones, et cetera. Um, so currently I think my days kind of just are a lot of juggling between different projects. Um, so I, I don't have like an ideal answer for this, but I guess um, I think what I, what I will say is similarly to what Matt was saying, sort of like that skill of being able to respond quickly to things. So for us, you know, sometimes we're in the midst of like recording research and we figure out, oh, something's off or the data's off or it's not sort of going the way that we thought it would be. Having that sort of ability to, to pivot really quickly and sort of be able to say, okay, like, let me think on my feet, what can I do? Like, what is sort of like a potential solution to this problem is key. And I think like Sermon is a great opportunity to start practicing that, to start developing that skill, because no matter what job you're in, it's likely, I think for most jobs that you will sometimes find yourself in that situation where it's like a problem suddenly arises and you only have a limited amount of time to find a solution for it. So I think um, really take the time to do that and embrace it. I know it's very stressful when you're you know, in the middle of committee and then something happens and you have to respond quickly, it can be stressful. It, it you know, there's tension, there's, or there's all of that, but, but really embrace that as a learning opportunity because I know for me, I've had to use that skill in my current, in all of my different roles currently and in my past roles. So um, just have fun with it because um, it, it's definitely something that's gonna keep coming up in your future career. Want me to go, Matt? Or Keith, excuse me. Yeah, that's um, all good. I, I think an advantage of what Matt and Nell have with their international work over what have I've experienced is they've actually been able to stay in the same place long enough to take their clothes out of the suitcase and really get to it. You know, you know, Matt's been in Kabul for five years, as an example. Um, when you're in the consulting world, whether it's campaign consulting, public affairs consulting, management consulting, you're either busy being busy because you're billing by the hour or the day, or you're busy trying to be busy, you know, meaning you're out writing proposals and trying to drum up business. So I, I really don't have specific tips to answer this question with one exception. I can tell you this, at this stage of my career with my international work, I, in my contract, time limit it per day. I time limit it to eight hours a day or 10 hours a day. Because what in the world is the point of my being in Quito, Ecuador, if I'm just going to spend the whole time in someone's office? Yeah, totally agree. I think the pandemic makes us rethink a lot about how we use our time. So, 
Yeah. Well, with that, we are actually coming up on time. So I'm going to, again, pass it back to our panelists for uh, just any quick closing things, anything that they feel like they really wanted to mention, but maybe we didn't have a question uh, regarding it. So I'm going to, well, why don't we start with Yanel? We'll go to Gary and then we'll end with Matt. So any kind of closing thoughts or last minute recommendations, advice? Yeah. Yeah, I think something that um, is really important that Ashley and Matt brought up was the, the issue of unpaid internships and sort of don't let that discourage you or don't let that sort of make you self-conscious. I also never had an unpaid internship. And I remember, you know, I wanted a career in like politics and public policy and everybody was always saying, go to Congress, intern at Congress. But the problem is Congress mostly doesn't pay you to work there. And I never could get that actual congressional experience on my resume but actually then I found other ways in which like, how do I find a paid opportunity that allows me to engage with congressional work? So I, I found political organizations, I found advocacy organizations that were working in DC with congressional members. So I was always in and out of Congress. It just, you wouldn't see, oh, I worked for so-and-so's office on my resume. And I think it, it's really important because sometimes people will tell you, oh, well, you have to have that one opportunity and even if it's unpaid, it has to be on your resume if you want to make it in this career. And that's not necessarily true. I think the skill of being able to sort of find creative ways to get to where you are is really important. And so like definitely don't feel just because everyone says, oh, you need this like particular experience and it happens to be unpaid or it happens to be something that you just feasibly cannot actually do. Don't let that discourage you and don't feel that you're not going to find success in whatever career path you want just because you don't have this one thing that other people had access to because there's just there's many ways to make it work and i think um, you learn a lot also throughout just being able to say okay well i can't do this let me try to think of creative ways in which i can still gain those skills or i can still sort of be able to explore this particular field or this particular opportunity. So there's definitely ways if you're someone who cannot do an unpaid internship, there are ways to sort of still find a way to make it into a political career, an international career. Um, so don't let it, don't let people sort of put you down just because you might not have a specific experience in your resume. Gary? Yeah, thanks. I guess what Listen, it's a big world out there, which means there are a number of international opportunities, multinational corporations, non-governmental organizations, foreign service. Believe it or not, actually, the State Department has twice as many professionals uh, dealing with subject areas than they do foreign service officers. So th th there, there are a variety of ways of having an international career. I think if you're trying to distill down which way to go, it's rather, do you want a career that has short-term international experiences, you know, or do you want longer-term experiences where you're literally living someplace for months or years at a time? Yeah, great. Absolutely well said. Um, I'll keep it brief. Um, you know, the, the thing that I was thinking through this entire discussion today was two things and apologies for a little bit of alliteration to end it but number one is mentorship and the second is a mantra uh, so first find yourself a mentor um, especially if you're not sure which direction you want to head or if you have a very clear direction of where you want to go find somebody working in that space get to know them make sure they're a professional practitioner. Uh, I'm fortunate enough to have one of my mentors on the call today, Dr. Cindy Combs. And, you know, she guided me through my undergraduate career after I graduated college, well into grad school. And, you know, through her experience, I was able to, to target, you know, that next step that would lead to, to success in my, in my career and professional development. And then the other thing I would say, you know, a mantra is, look, the dream is free, but the hustle is sold separately. Um, it's up to you to dig deep and, you know, push yourself forward. Um, dreams come all day and, and they're great, but if you're not willing to put the work in, it's not going to come true. And to be honest, I think that was a 
very great way to kind of bring this all together because again yeah um and i again i just want to express a thank you to um again to our organization sermon for helping put this together uh, my colleague desiree and members of the board of directors for you know allowing this to happen and again thank our panelists too who um have brought this advice uh to us and you know now it's time to take the things that they've said and put it into practice um so thank you again for everybody who came and uh, I wish y'all a wonderful Friday and for delegates, um, a wonderful Sermon Charlotte 2021 and I'll see you around.